Turtle Fox. From a champion bodybuilder to a lifetime sentence for a double murder and freedom. Bertel Fox was released from prison 25 years after he was convicted for a double murder on the 22nd of May, 1998. On the 30th of September, 1997, in St. Kitts and Nevis, 20-year-old beauty queen Leoka Brown and her mother, 36-year-old Violet Brown, were fatally shot by Fox. Fox, who previously had been engaged to Leoka, was arrested and charged with the murders. On the 22nd of May, 1998, Fox was convicted of murder of the two women. He was originally sentenced to death by hanging, but after an appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, his sentence was changed to life in prison. The majority of bodybuilding historians and fans believe that Bertel Fox would remain in jail until his death. The news of his sudden release was truly shocking. Bertel Fox was given a second chance in life when on the 4th of August 2022, Fox was pardoned by the Governor General of St. Kitts and Nevis after serving 25 years in prison and is now a free man living in the UK. Bertel Fox's son, Sean Fox, confirmed on Facebook that Bertel is now in the UK with family a few days later. Bertel Fox, the bodybuilder. During the peak of his career, Bertel Fox was one of the biggest and strongest bodybuilders in the world. Bertel won numerous titles with the AAU, NABA, and the IFBB during a bodybuilding career that lasted 25 years. Bertel started his bodybuilding career with NABA, winning titles such as the Junior and Senior Mr. Brishan, and the prestigious NABA Mr. Universe. Later on in his career, Bertel switched over to the IFBB where he would compete in various events, consistently placing in the top 10. The best placing at the Mr. Olympia for Bertel Fox was at the 1983 Olympia, where he placed fifth. This was a controversial moment for Bertel, as he believed he should have been placed higher. Bertel eventually walked off the stage after being told to remain by Ben Wider. According to Rick Wayne, Bertel was known to allegedly have a temper, and this would eventually ruin Bertel's career and his entire life. After walking away from the sport of bodybuilding in 1994, Bertel moved back to the Caribbean island of St. Kitts. Bertel would start his new dream life by building a beautiful house and gym on the island. Unfortunately, Bertel's dream life would not last long as just three years after moving to the island, Fox was convicted of a double murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Gary Stridham reveals shocking details of double murder. Immediately after his release, numerous bodybuilding legends that shared the same stage as Bertel Fox celebrated his release from jail. Bodybuilding superstar Gary Stridham was very close to Bertel Fox, and he revealed some shocking details of what allegedly happened on the day of the double murder. On a recent post on his official Facebook page, Gary Stridham published a number of posts about Bertel Fox after his release from prison. It was evident that Stridham was very happy about the news of Bertel's release from prison, but he also went on to reveal what he believed happened on the day of the murders. Gary Stridham could not hide his emotions. Gary Stridham alleges the double murder was an accident. This is a part of the details published by Gary Stridham on Facebook, the 8th of August, 2022. Bertel Fox released. It almost made me cry today. We love you, Bertel, and those of you that didn't know it was an accident. The gun was not his, and a struggle ensued causing this accident. It wouldn't have happened if she didn't have a gun in her bag. What then happened was a lynching where the locals wanted retribution. Well, they made him sit for 25 years. He was originally sentenced to death by hanging, but after an appeal to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, his sentence was changed to life in prison. On the 4th of August, 2022, Fox was pardoned by the Governor General of St. Kitts and Nevis after serving 25 years and is now a free man living in the UK. Enjoy the rest of your life, mate. The few of us that believed in you, we still do. God bless you and your family. Gary continued, I am so happy for you and your family. I have been relatively quiet here on Facebook, but this had to all be said, so people can get just a small sample of what you went through. 
You were my idol when I first started training, and then I was blessed to meet you, compete with you, train with you, and get to know you. You were never credited enough for your awesome physique. You one of the best of all time. The fortitude of a man is realized when pushed, and you were pushed beyond just bodybuilding. Much respect. Now go on, mate. Enjoy your life. After reading his comments, Rick Wayne, who was also very close to Bertle Fox, told Stridham that his version of what happened is one heck of a story. Gary immediately replied to Rick Wayne. Rick Wayne, it's not a story, my friend. A pardon very rarely comes unless there is some credibility in the story. It was a corrupt prosecutor and local public pressure to make the English bodybuilder be the fall guy for this horrible accident. At worst, it was manslaughter because it wasn't his gun, and it was at his business. Some people are incredibly unlucky because it could have happened to any of us. One day I will tell of the day the FBI tried something with me. When an ex-girlfriend of mine was murdered? Long story. If you dig a bit, you can find that story, too. Gary was then asked to explain what happened by another reader. How can two people being shot be an accident? He, Bertle Fox, came to his business and his girlfriend and mother were in the process of trying to steal it from him. When he confronted them, the girlfriend tried to pull a handgun from her bag, a struggle ensued, and it went off killing the both of them. It was a terrible accident, concluded Stridham. Next up is the documentary, Death and the Bodybuilder. If you want to read the latest bodybuilding news and features, log on to evolutionofbodybuilding.net. Enjoy. Be inspired. This is Fox, brutal Fox, and he's bad at You know what I'm saying? Watch it. Enjoy. British muscle man Bertil Fox, twice winner of Mr. Universe, was once the most popular bodybuilder in the world. He is currently on death row in the Caribbean, waiting to be hanged for the double murder of his girlfriend and her mother. Throughout his life, Bertel kept secrets. He never wanted anyone to know who he really was. People saw a smiling, confident and massively developed bodybuilder. In fact, he was a man full of insecurities. His body took him all around the world, bringing him fame and fortune. But it was to be his downfall. Bertel grew up in Kilburn in North London. His father died when he was only 14. Bertel stepped into his dad's shoes, but as a puny teenager, he was out of his depth in the role of provider. Until one day, he discovered that there was a way to mold his body into that of a grown man. Bodybuilding held the key. Bertel was quite secretive, but many actually started because I don't think he wanted anyone to know um, how long he was training. But Bertha started very, very young. He was this skinny little narrow-shouldered kid that no one would ever believe would develop in such a massive muscle physique. Phil Toppin grew up with Bertel in North London. He remained a lifelong friend. We both loved the sport very much. Uh, he must have been just as crazy as I was about muscle. From the time I was a little kid, I was always crazy about it, you know, intrigued about having big muscles and looking at guys with great big muscles and so on. And he, he was the same.
Wags Gym in East London was the mecca for up-and-coming bodybuilders in the 60s and 70s. It was here that Bertel would meet his heroes, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Caribbean champion bodybuilder Rick Wayne. It seems like I've known Bertel ever since he was a baby. Uh, when I was competing uh, when I, in my heyday in London, um, Bertel was about 14, 15, but a 14, 15 year old that everybody talked about. First of all, he was a very shy person, very shy, uh, easily embarrassed. And what uh, he didn't know, he certainly wasn't aware of, but other people were, and they looked at him, they saw a potential champion. Burton was genetically gifted like very few people are. I, I've never seen another bodybuilder grow that fast in my life. I mean, up to now, you know. Every year, Bertha was much bigger than the previous year. There was a guy who seemed to have been born to be a bodybuilder. Black bodybuilders, it is generally accepted, have a problem with calves. Bodybuilders, few black bodybuilders start off with good calves. This is something we always said that the white guys were born with, the, the propensity to have great calves. Bertle had great calves always. His proportions were impeccable. I'm almost lost for words describing Bertle because Bertle happened at a time when there was nobody else like that. Bodybuilding was looked on with suspicion in the 1970s. Muscle men were seen as oddballs and ridiculed in the mainstream. But Bertle had found somewhere he belonged. We didn't care that people, there were people who thought we were freaks or that we were silly or that we had security problems. I mean, bodybuilders have, have, have gotten a shellacking from a bunch of skinny little pencil pushers who call themselves psychologists. But they, they, they don't know. Most of them are unfit, skinny little runts. They are getting their rocks off these little skinnies by picking on the big guys. And the big guys have no brains and the big guys are just bloated up insecure people. We considered that kind of criticism the criticism of threatens, you know, for guys who didn't know what they were doing. Or that guys were using those lines to justify their own physical inferiority. Let me tell you this, there is an orgasmic feel uh, and a long lasting orgasmic feel about working out your endorphins and the muscles pumped up with blood and that is why I suppose that once you've been a serious bodybuilder you never really give it up. So only we can really explain to you what it feels like to go into a gym and pump up. So let the others laugh. They will never know. As a dedicated bodybuilder Bertel was force-feeding himself 10 meals a day, training 14 times a week, and taking steroids to keep up with the competition. But there was another side to Bertel's life that he wasn't good at dealing with. At 20, he already had a family of his own. Sean Fox is Bertel's only son. He lives in North London. Every child you missed out on everything, like your dad taking you out and all the talking. I never had none of that. When you had problems at school and all that, you had no one there, like a man to sit there and talk to me about stuff. There's no one there. Like you can't have a kid and all that, and hardly spend time with a child if you're going off training you know, in this country, that country, doing shows. You know, the child don't really see you as much as it should. So personally, they, they shouldn't really have kids at them sort of young ages, just have them a bit later or not have kids at all. Despite not being around much as a dad, Bertel always supported his family financially. He worked as a driver on London Underground. He would say to me, Roman, I hate running up and down those fucking tunnels like a rat. It was always just part of his plan to do it, to do it, you know, to use, use London Underground and use the job for as long as he needed to. And uh, he would say, you know, boy, I'm going to chuck all this in and all these suckers, then they, they, one day they ain't going to see me and I'm going to be off and I'm going to hit the big time. By his mid-twenties, Bertel had won almost every title Britain had to offer. He was Mr. Midlands, Mr. Britain, Mr. United Kingdom. 
Bertel's relentless pursuit of muscle had made him the best loved bodybuilder in the UK. Thousands of fans flocked to see him when he entered Mr. Universe, the toughest and most prestigious British title. In 1970, it was a very, very significant year for Bertel because he came up against the best opposition I think that he had met up to then. One gentleman in particular was Serge Newbray. Newbray looked good, he was on form, he was very sharp, very muscular, very classical, beautiful package. But, uh, you know, I'm getting goose pimples now just thinking about it. When Berto presented himself, bang, he would hit them with the most muscular, and that set everybody up. First of all, it began with a thumping on the ground, or the foot stomping, and it rose, rose almost to a crescendo. Bertel's fans began to chant, and a phrase that would stay with bodybuilding forever was born. It's become an expression now that's used quite a lot. You may have heard the expression beef, or beef it. Beef it, yeah. That's what they used to say, beef, beef. Beef it. Beef it, beef it, Bertel, beef it. Bertel's fans, afraid that the judges might give the title to the more experienced Newbury, surged forward chanting Bertel's name. They gathered around the judges and they pushed the judges forward and it was quite scary. Screaming, beep it, Bertel, beep it, Bertel. The judges dared not deny the man of the people the title. At 27, Bertel became Mr. Universe. Bertel's name was spread throughout the land, throughout the gyms. He was like a messiah in a way, you know. And uh, they loved him. In the bodybuilding world, Box was a star. But Mr. Universe still drove trains for a living. There wasn't much money in bodybuilding, but there was an element of glamour. Bertel could have his pick of young, attractive girls. One woman in particular set her sights on him. Her name was Kim, and she would mark his life indelibly. Within three months, Bertel had left his girlfriend and three children to marry her. But Kim's influence didn't stop there. She wanted Bertel to move to America. He had been offered a contract by Joe Weider, the biggest promoter in the world. But Bertel had reservations about American bodybuilding. Bertel gave me every possible reason why he didn't want to go to America, America. He gave me all the English cliches. America is too much of a rat race. These guys are too much into making money. It's racist. He's a black guy. He's more at home in his little pool in London. As a champion bodybuilder, Rick Wayne was already contracted to Joe Weider's company. Joe asked Rick to persuade Bertel to come to the States. I soon discovered that I was wasting my time trying to persuade Bertel. So I turned on to Kim and she said, don't worry about it, I'll, I'm persuading because she had a ways of persuading Bertel. Two weeks later, back in California, everything was sealed. They signed, uh, signed on, and Bertel came over. On reflection, I wish I had never persuaded Bertel Fox to come to America. Bertil Fox flew to America with the world at his feet. He had a contract with a top promoter in bodybuilding. His video featured one of his biggest fans. Well, I, I was on the day one when I saw Bertil compete in London at the Mr. Universe Foundation. And he became the big sensation, which was in the mid-70s. I was a big admirer of this simply because he represents the traditional bodybuilder and strongman. I think that uh, he is like the new uh, bodybuilder to be. I mean, he is like the big time of the day. At the age of 32, he was finally ready to compete in the toughest competition in the world, Mr. Olympia. 
I think that uh, he has a great chance in 1983 at the Anderson Munich to, to win the Olympia. And then as uh, soon as he does that, he will keep it for a long time because he's of course young and has still many years to go. Für England, Bertil Fox. Bertel was set to win. The crowd's reaction said it all. In fifth place. Bertel in fifth place. Bertel Fox, England. Everybody knew he'd won it, you see, and Fox nigga, all of them was all supporting him. They thought they said he won it, but, you know what I mean? He lost it, he said he was gutted. That's, that's, that's his only real big regret. In Elster Club, Mr. Olympia, Samir Banu. After Bertel lost Olympia, he started to openly criticise the bodybuilding establishment. You know, your whole, your whole future depends on those five or ten little guys that, uh, that lies there. Your whole fate lies in them. These guys have never trained. They've never worked out. They don't know what the word diet means. They don't know what it means to diet till your head begins to spin. I think the sport is our sport right. and we should judge it. We should have more say in the sport that we, we made because we are bodybuilding and we should be judged by our peers. A guy would feel a little bit more, more better to know well, that he's being put in 12th place by good guys, you know, than some fat guy in a blue jacket who's never trained, never done anything, who puts you and says, ah, oh, you should be a little bit more cut and shit like this. Being an international judge and having judged at contests all over the world, there is a plus factor, and that's the personality of the individual. Arnold Schwarzenegger sold himself to the judges better than most people. He actually said, good morning, gentlemen, how are you? Nice seat to see you again, lovely faces. And he came forward, I said, please, Arnold, it's lovely to see you, but get back in the lineup, please. He projected the personality, Bertel didn't. He figured that if he had the physique and all that went with it, and he presented it, that was good enough, but it's not. Bob Wilson is not an exhibitionist. This is it. He would call bodybuilders crawlers that do that sort of thing. You know, he can handle that. Because Bob knew he was better than those guys, but he lacked what it what it required to go and stand next to next to them on a stage he, he, he couldn't handle that so he th those people knew Bertel was a phenomenon they knew Bertel was better than they were but they soon discovered that Bertel did not have self-confidence according to Rick Wayne Bertel's resentment of bodybuilding was rooted in prejudice 
Little Fox hated white people. He just, he just hated them. Um, he always felt that they were trying to use him. The guy was in, in a sport that um, controlled by white people. Joe Reader is white, he's Jewish. The people who own the magazines are all white. Burfield was wrapped up in an inferiority situation um, where whites were concerned. It was during the months after Bertel's failure at Mr. Olympia that Rick noticed things weren't going well in Bertel's marriage with Kim. He would do things and come to my apartment and tell me, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. What made me do that when, I, when he beat up Kim? There were times when Bertel would, would, would ask his wife to go buy him stuff from the supermarket, stuff that, he, that no amateur bodybuilder would even dream of eating because of the immediate effect. Salted cashew, for example. Bertel knew he shouldn't be but he would send it by two or three tins of it, huge tins. She refused because she had learned enough by then, telling me she, he shouldn't, he'd beat her. She would have to get it. If she went and gotten it, and got it, he would beat her too. So, but, had, but he would always be so sorry, which I suppose is um, classic behavior, classic bachelor's behavior. You do it and then you're really sorry and sick with himself. He'd come to my apartment and cry. I would have to talk to Kim later on and you know, tell him to be patient and all that kind of stuff, but the guy was a really, I discovered in the States, a time bomb ticking away. The pressure was on Bertel to compete for Olympia 1984, but during training he suffered a huge setback. And I got this call, uh, to my surprise, it was Bertel. He said, I'm, uh, this is Fox. And I said, oh, hi, and he said, I mean, uh, have you heard it, what happened to me? I said, no. And um, he told me Kim left him. He just told me that he was preparing, and Kim called and said, I'm leaving you, and uh, I've left the apartment. So he just packed up everything, went back to California, just ceased his preparation for the Olympia, the up-and-coming Olympia, Head back to California, and she was gone. So Bertha walked into my, my my place, all depressed. I don't know if I should get into the contest. Maybe I should get a doctor's certificate, saying I'm ill. All of that stuff. I said, "Come on." Went into my bathroom, for the full-length mirror there, and I had him take his shirt off. Bertha looked absolutely out of this world. I had him doing his favorite pose, which was the most muscular pose. Here we do this, all the muscles together. He went from post to post, arm shots, back shots, and out of this world, abdominals and everything, and doing it aggressively, the sweat pouring down his body. Finally, toweled himself and put the shirt back, and I said, but you look fantastic, you look, you're nothing can stop you. He agreed, walked out of the room, went into the living room, and he says, but you know, I only look that way in your mirror. I don't look that way in my mirror. <laughs> sums up the war that that man had with himself. He broke the contract and did not compete, and he did in fact get a doctor's certificate saying he was ill. Bertel did not compete in the contest. Bertel kept competing throughout the 80s, but never achieved the form of Mr. Olympia 1983. At Mr. Olympia 89, he didn't even make the top 10. You've had some disappointment and setbacks during your career, no doubt. Uh, like, what is it that keeps you going? It's love. It's hard. I've had more setbacks. I don't think they can do anything more with Bertel Fox. You know, I turn up in shape and I turn big, they say, oh, you haven't got enough cuts. When I turn up in cut, they say, oh, he's too lean. Because these people can destroy you. They can play trick with your mind. You can be in great shape and they got you and they ignore you. Hey, tip for fuck that. Yes. Body is be something that I love. And that's what's keeping me going. Not the fame and all these bullshit of walking around like some of these prima donnas, these little shit who win, win a little contest and they go around like uh, they, 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 they shit down smell and things like that. You know? What keeps me going is love. Oh, right, nice, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh. How about 91? Uh, competition, ideas, uh, plans? I don't know. I've got one or two ideas, but I always find, you know, 
But when you talk about things, they never come true. I'm a very unlucky bloke, unfortunately, and all for my life, you know, I should have been over on Mr. Olympia ages ago. But some funny reasons, there's always some obstacles in my way. So I have a rough idea what I would like to do. By the moment, I just sort of keep it to myself and just hope that it works out. did have a plan. At the age of 42, he retired from bodybuilding and returned to his birthplace, the paradise island of St. Kitts in the Caribbean. It was to be his most unfortunate move yet. Virgil Fox retired to St. Kitts in the Caribbean in 1992. He wanted to give something back to the island of his birth and train up the young men to become champion bodybuilders. He also thought that by returning to St. Kitts, he would finally find somewhere to fit in and get the respect he deserved. Virgil bought some land outside the capital, Basseterre, and started to build his dream home and gym sinking every penny he'd ever made into the construction. He was this big movie star. Everybody looked up at him as Mr. Universe. He's living in St. Kitts. I mean, everybody would have liked to meet this man. So he was like, as we said, one of the top class. But he was not what we thought. A local girl caught Bertel's eye, a swimsuit model called Leoka Brown. He was 42, she was 19. Molly Builders like people in the prime of their time when you're as perfect and fit and, and hard like Brittle Fox you want a woman close to that you can only get that at 1918 bodybuilders is a physical oriented bodybuilders is not into soul and mind and whatnot first he sees her physicality how many kids does she have is she in shape what turns him on is not that she's a woman she's a woman in great shape our first contestant is Miss St. Kitts Brewers Limited, Leoka Brown. This evening, Leoka appears in a sparkling swimsuit entitled The Lost Sunset. The low scooped back line highlights Leoka's well sculpted back and a true model perfect figure. Typical of Whitley, he, he would not go find himself some girl in St. Kitts who was a homebody. And look what look what he went and got himself a model who was interested in a modeling career. Photographs of her on the beach in teeny little bikinis. Whitley was in, you know this is exactly the opposite of what Whitley Fox needed. I don't see why he went out with them sort of girls. He used to like them sort of girls, you know, the pretty sort of young girl. You know, I sort of messed him up. You know, he, he liked them sort of girl, but at the same time. He couldn't stand the, the arguments, like he don't like people talking back to him, you know, so that's where you can get loggers with him. Leoka's older brother, Rodney, used to live with Leoka and their mother, Violet. From what I knew, 
it didn't have a bright future. As far as what my mother thought about the relationship, she she felt like it was a very bad idea, probably because of the age difference and she knew in Leoka, knowing that she probably wasn't ready for a relationship of that, you know, that status, that size. Leoka's aunts, Denise and Pearl, run a shop called Style and Style in the centre of Bath Terre. She was a controlling person, you know, wanted to dictate she life, tell her where to go. He used to even stop her from visiting her family. Leoka, do you think that women are given a fair deal in our community? On a personal basis, I don't think so. We are still looked upon as not being as equal as men. But on a professional basis, we have moved ahead quite a bit. We now own our own businesses. We are doctors, lawyers, judges. We are no longer in the dark ages. All right. Thank you very much, Leoka. Leoka moved into Bertel's house despite her family's disapproval. She lived with him for two years. Their home life was often troubled and there were rumours of Bertel beating Leoka and of Leoka cheating on him. and of Leoka cheating on him. When Burr first met Leota, he was very keen on it. He told me about her and so on. Um, a few months later, he called me and he told me that things weren't that good. And she's always doing all sorts of different things. And I said to him, why didn't you get rid of her? And I told Leota that I'm perhaps the, the only person I really know about who inside out. And I told her that if she doesn't have the correct intentions about this relationship, to get out of it. Leoka's family also wanted the relationship to end. Her mother, Violet, intervened. This is Violet, her mom. She had so much going for her, because she had started her business, and it was going quite well. She was a real good designer. I wish Leoka had told us what was going on between Bertel and her. Because we might have been able to help in some way. I think that, well, I know he would have hated us too the way he hated her mother because she knew and she tried to get her out of that relationship. Taking her mother's advice, Leoka finished with Bertel and she immediately started dating a white American student. Yet again, another woman has done it to him. Because that was the paranoia. White people doing it to him, his wife did it to him, and this girl has done it to him again, with a white guy. And that was enough, to, if you know Bertel Fox, that would have been enough to blow him right out of the sky. At first, Bertel seemed to take the news well. He remained on good terms with Leoka. He returned to England for a break and asked Leoka to look after his home, his possessions and his gun. I didn't know Bertel did have a licence firearm. He, when I was in St. Kitts, he told me he was going to get one because the house is out there on its own. I, I told him not to. And he said that he's going to need one because he's going to be living over there by himself. The next house is several hundred yards away from it. But uh, I didn't know he actually acquired one. On the 27th of September, 1997, Bertel came back from his trip to England. Three days later, he visited Leoka at her mother's design shop. Only Bertel knows what happened next. Well, about 10, 16 a.m. on um, Tuesday, the 3rd of September, 1997, we received a call by the 911 emergency line that two persons had been shot on Keon Street. Um, near a place called Karen's Fabric. 
it was a shock to me that two persons had been shot. And my first thought was probably might have been some person involved in the drug trade or something. But the thing that was domestically related was the last thing on my mind. I was in town working with a friend and then someone came down and said the muscle man just shoot uh, a woman and then I said who is this muscle man and he said Bartle Fox he said but is your friend I said yes I said oh my god just like that I said oh my god Foxy Foxy finish just like that you know I said I'm so sorry for him One of my co-workers came and told me that you know, my mother and sister were shot. Um, a lot of things started racing through my mind. Um, he told me that, from what he understood, they were shot in the leg and the arm. So, although I was extremely concerned, I felt a little bit relieved that, okay, well, hopefully it's nothing too serious. In fact, the injuries were fatal. Leoka was shot in the back, and Violet was shot twice, once in the leg and once in the neck. One of the nurses did call me in to take the ring off of my mother's finger, which was the swing. Um, and that was the, that was the last time I saw her before she died. shooting is really considered abnormal and then you hear that two persons have been shot and the time of the day you know it's 10 in the morning very broad daylight you know with somebody walking and shoot some person so it's really really caught, caught us by surprise it was the first double murder in the history of the island the victim's family were left to pick up the pieces we had to come back. I think it was the Friday. Then we came back. The blood was there still. Everything was still there, just as it, just as it happened. So the Saturday we came back and we just cleaned it up. It was awful, awful, awful. The island celeb was charged with murder, even though there had been no witnesses to the shooting. The people of St. Kitts struggled to understand why this tragedy had happened. But the family of the dead women felt they already knew the answer. He couldn't accept the loss. He couldn't accept her not wanting him anymore. And um, he felt that he had to do something. Um, he felt like if he couldn't have her, then why should anyone have her? Bertel was charged with murder, and everyone on the island followed the trial. I think it's a small place. Everybody know each other. When something happened, everybody hears something about it. So when they went in the courthouse, they didn't really listen to the facts. Their mind was set on what they hear on the word. mixed reaction to what had happened. Particularly in relation to the mother, everybody was sorry for the mother, but in relation to the young lady, there was some things are not so pleasant being said about her. There were rumors going around all the time saying Leoka had stolen money from him, Leoka had fight him, have another fella, or carry somebody in his place, and all those rumors. Around the trial time, a lot of people was kind of like building us, building it up to be like another O.J. Simpson kind of thing where this popular 
athletic person, you know, majority of people would say there's just no way they're going to convict this guy and, you know, he's Bertel Fox. Bertel hired the best and most expensive lawyer on the island, Dr. Henry Brown. I got the impression that he was very confident in his mind that he had done nothing wrong. Because he was reasonably sure that he would not have to suffer incarceration for any considerable length of time. At the trial, Bertel made a statement. He claimed that when he returned from England, his gun was missing from his home. Looking for an explanation, he went to find Leoka, who was in her mother's shop. He said her mother had the gun and had refused to give it back. A fight started and the gun went off accidentally. At first, I feel sorry for him, Miller, because I'm sure that he is sorry for what he did. But when I went to the courthouse and heard what he said, that it was an accident, I mean, it gets me more angry. A few members of Bertel's family still lived on the island. His fiercest supporter during the trial was his niece, Elretha Simpson. His girlfriend's mom and him, they weren't really on speaking terms. As a matter of fact, in my mind, I, I felt that she hated him. Yes? So, when he went there, she had his gun and, I guess, uh, this pouch um, in her two hands and, like, playing um, with them, uh, saying um, remarks like, these you want, you know, you wouldn't get them, you know, and talking to her daughter, telling her, do not come in here with that. Now, when we say something like that, that is like um, something uh, awful to say to somebody, something degrading, and you call somebody that in our colloquial terms here in St. Kitts. So I guess um, that would cause him, you know, agitate him. He grabbed for the weapon, and as he grabbed for the weapon, there was a resistance from the mother. The weapon went off, because by that time, Layoka had positioned herself between him and the mother. And so the weapon went off. The resistance continued. The second shot went off. And a bullet caught each of them. I want to know how an accident could be shooting two people. And he, um, he said, right, that they were struggling. The mother and he were struggling for the gun. That's what uh, I heard. And how, how to, uh, yes, uh, how it went off and he didn't get no shot. His defense was that the gun, uh, I was wrestling with, Bob, with um, Luca for the gun and the gun went off accidentally. There's no doubt that anybody other than Bottle Fox shot and killed these people. The policemen did not take any fingerprints from the gun. So they, in, in truth and in fact, they did not know if Burton actually came there with the gun or if the gun was there. hearing came to hang jury you know they had to have a second hearing and that is when things went into action they started having a lot of candlelight vigils and having matches uh, for domestic violence against women and everybody got involved this incident happened at a time when the country was quite sensitized um, to violence against women and had uh, formed a view in their mind that frequent violence against women should be arrested, number one. And in a small community like this, when all the women are singing one tune, it is difficult for the men to sing otherwise. During the second trial, another factor went against Bertel. It was the very thing he spent his life trying to achieve. He was a huge man, 
comparatively speaking. That is one of the telling factors against him in the mind of the man in the street. Because they all the view whatever weapons they had, given his strength and obvious physical capacity, he could have um, dealt with them differently. Personally, if I would not have picked a fight with him. Because I think you could probably take one of them and just throw me aside. You know, so it, it, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense. I heard the judge say in his summation that he can't imagine a man that big running from a woman with a gun. Now, could you imagine a woman with a gun is as dangerous as they get? Bertel was found guilty of double murder. Whoever is convicted of murder shall suffer death by hanging as a felon. That is unequivocal. Bertel has been on death row for the last five years. When I went to see him after they put him away, it was so upsetting to me because uh, when they let me in, they locked so many doors behind me. He was so sad, the, 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 you could see the impression on his face that he, that he wanted to cry. So when I came outside, I just stand up and I shake my head and I say, Oh my God, Foxy is finished. The Privy Council in London is the final court of appeal for the Caribbean. It recently ruled that the automatic sentence of hanging for murder is unlawful. Deliberations continue. Bertel could still hang, or he may have his sentence reduced to life imprisonment. Bertel got a verdict of lifetime in prison. I would definitely much prefer the death sentence simply because, to me, lifetime in prison is still a loose end. You never know. The roof could get blown off of the jail and he escapes or whatever. Anything could happen. You know, once he's still alive, there's life is hope. Once, you, once you're alive, there's hope. If I sit there and think about where he is now, sometimes I might cry now and again, you know what I mean? You know, I have pictures of my wall and of him and all that, but that's not as bad looking at pictures, but, you know, I, I try not to think about where he is right now. I try to figure the happy times when I see him, you know what I mean? That's what I get through personally. I'd like to see a picture of his old house. So I will go out there this year sometime. See if anything's left. Bertel Fox, twice winner of Mr. Universe, was one of the most popular bodybuilders in the world. Now with five years of prison time behind him, he has shrunk to half his former size. For a time I was told he worked out in prison with, with buckets of water and, and so on, makeshift weights. And I'm told he doesn't even do that now. That must be a horror. For a guy who always thought, no matter how he looked in the mirror, he saw some little guy poking back at him. Imagine what it's like now looking at himself, perhaps weighing on him and 
60 pounds. That's a man who weighed 235 of muscle. I, I don't even know execution can be worse than what he must be going through right now.